welcome to another episode of Access-Ability. It's a show on YouTube where I talk about the video game industry, accessibility and representation. Basically, how can we help more people to play games and more people to see themselves in the games they play? Released way back in the distant year of 2015, the original Life is Strange is a game about a young woman with superpowers. She has the ability to rewind time and attempts to use it to help solve the mystery of a missing girl with the help of her punk best friend Chloe. In the years since its release, we have seen spin-off titles, we've seen comic adaptations, and we've seen sequels involving new young adults with new superpowers on new adventures. The newest entry in the series, Life is Strange True Colours, follows the adventure of Alex, a young woman who discovers she has the ability to sense incredibly strong emotions in other people and, if they're strong enough, read their mind and hear some of their thoughts associated with that very strong emotion that they are currently experiencing. If you've played 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, this is basically like the spell Detect Thoughts. You can get the surface level thoughts of what's right on their mind in this moment, only so long as it's connected to whatever strong emotion you are sensing in them. Alex moves to a new town, it's a little rural community in the mountains, and becomes embroiled in a mystery and a cover-up that risks the safety of everyone in this little community, and has to use her superpowers to try and get to the bottom of things. So today, on Access Ability, we're going to be talking about Life is Strange True Colours. We're going to talk about some of the accessibility features found in the game, which of the game's accessibility features could perhaps have been implemented in more useful ways, and some of the emotional content that you should brace for if you are going into this game and want to know what to expect. Also, we're going to talk about how gay or not this game is. Spoilers, it's... It, you, you can be gay if you want. <laughs> when you first boot up Life is Strange True Colours, before you reach the main menu for the game, an on-screen pop-up alerts players that the game features a dedicated set of accessibility options, and asks if the player would like to jump to that menu before proceeding. If players say yes, they are brought to an accessibility settings menu, containing a few standard options and a few unique options I've not seen offered before. Players can change the font used for subtitles and in-game text from its default stylized font to a font called Source Sans Pro, a sans serif font included to attempt to make the text more legible to dyslexic players. The game does not show players a preview of the alternative font in this menu, or label it as a font that may be more legible for dyslexic players, instead relying on players to recognise that the fact it has the word sans in it probably means it's sans serif, and know in advance that sans serif fonts are easier for them as dyslexic players to read. The fact that this is both not labelled as a dyslexia assistant font, or shown to the player in the settings menu, both reduce the usefulness of this offering, but it's still a positive to see an alternative font option offered to players, even if it could have been a little more transparently presented. By turning on the longer choice timer setting, players can increase, but not entirely remove, the timer for dialogue choices during timed events. This gives players longer to mentally process the choices they are making, but it does still require some degree of timing pressure to be present. The Skip Gameplay Prompt option allows players to skip a handful of quick time events in the game, where progression is locked behind reaction speed. If you are someone who struggles with reacting quickly to prompts, this option is a useful inclusion. There is no option to give extra reaction time on those events and still take part in them, but they're at least able to be avoided if they're going to be a progression roadblock for the player. Both jogging and activating superpowers as default are controlled by button holds, but both of these can be changed to toggle presses in the accessibility menu. True Colours, true to its name, also contains colour filter options for colourblind players, including filters for Deutronopia, Protonopia, and Tritonopia. The game also includes a filter strength slider, allowing players to pick the level of colour alteration required for them to best experience the game. Lastly, on the Accessibility Settings menu, we've got two interesting, unique, but flawed settings offerings. A brightness warning and a volume warning prompt. Put simply, when active, these settings will pause the game before visually intense or audibly intense scenes, and warn players of those sensory experiences coming up. 
Players are asked if they would like to go to the settings menu and briefly turn down the volume or the brightness before proceeding and experiencing the following scenes. So here's why I'm torn on these settings. I appreciate the ability to be warned before intense sensory moments, I recognise the value in being able to be warned and take measures to protect oneself before visually intense scenes come up, but pausing the game and asking the player to manually alter settings seems like a very strange way of achieving the desired result. I feel like the game could have, perhaps in addition, had a setting that turned off or automatically reduced the intensity of some of these moments. Maybe a setting that causes visual flashes to be less intense, or that normalised audio volume to reduce the instances of loud noises suddenly. Pausing the game and putting the onus on the player to make those alterations doesn't feel like the ideal solution for this particular set of problems, particularly because players don't know in advance how intense the sound or the visual will be. Um, knowing upfront how much to turn the brightness down or the volume down is tricky. Also, you don't know what kind of sound it is that's going to be loud, you don't know if it's going to be a loud shout, if it's going to be a loud sound effect or a loud piece of music, and the game has its audio divided by sliders. You don't know which slider to turn down, so you're going to have to sit and turn them all down just in case. It, it's not an ideal solution. I like that these warning-based settings exist. For myself as an autistic gamer, it did help me to brace for sensory data without avoiding it entirely. I didn't turn down those settings when prompted, but it did let me know to brace for them. But I felt while playing like an automated offering that could have evened out these points of intensity might have worked better. As the only option on offer, these warnings necessitated frequent pauses at many of the narrative's most intense moments. These broke up the flow of the story and put the onus on the player to alter their settings. While not included in the accessibility settings menu for some reason, the game does feature a few other accessibility settings in other sections of its settings menu. Subtitles in Life is Strange True Colours are turned on by default, and feature speaker names as default, but these can be turned off if wanted. Players can also alter subtitle size, increasing it to make it more legible, and adding a background to increase legibility against the game world. The game text can also be made larger, and interaction text can also have a background added behind it. For players who want to be aware of when they're making major choices, you can switch on prompts that will warn you before major choice moments, and give you the chance to reconsider your choices if desired. Moving away from the accessibility settings, I want to use a little of this episode to talk about some of the kinds of content to expect when playing through True Colours, and some of the LGBT representation visible in-game. Life is Strange True Colours is developed by Deck9, the developers of Life is Strange Before the Storm, rather than Don't Nod, who created the first two Life is Strange games, and 2020's Tell Me Why. One of the biggest differences between Don't Nod and Deck9 currently is their approach to content warnings. Where Tell Me Why featured a content warnings page with full spoilers released around six weeks before the release of the game, True Colours features no such warning system. I'll be pretty vague about the content warnings that are in the game in this video, but anyone interested in specifics can tweet me at LauraKBuzz on Twitter for a more comprehensive list. True Colours deals with a lot of emotions bubbling up out of control, and people unable to control their emotions driving themselves to act in dangerous ways at times. The game also deals with some pretty rough emotions that may impact those with abusive or emotionally detached or absent parents, both from the perspective of neglected children and from the perspective of parents who have unhealthy emotional responses to their children. Beyond that, in a couple of branches of the narrative, the player may experience first-hand accounts of deteriorative mental health conditions, presented in ways that may be upsetting for those who find those conditions distressing. With those warnings out of the way, I was actually really happy with the LGBT representation on offer in Life is Strange True Colours. The main character, Alex, is bisexual, and that's made pretty clear in the text of the narrative. While you are not pressured into a romance, the two main romance options offered in-game are both equally fleshed out. 
I'm usually the kind of person who always goes for the female romance option in games, as someone primarily attracted to women, but this game's big himbo with a beard is soft and lovable in a very endearing way that I found really engaging. The main female romance option is a radio DJ, musician, nerdy LARP geek, and has ambitions beyond her town, while the main male romance option has visions of a quiet domestic life nestled away from the world. Both make for very compelling paths to explore, and are given adequate time to, you know, get to know them and to get a feel for them. Given the game's setting in a small, isolated community, I was relieved that at no point in the plot was any character's sexuality demonised, with harassment and discrimination not used as plot points. Having now played through Life is Strange True Colours, I was really impressed with it. This is Deck Nine's first Life is Strange game that isn't based on the characters and settings of an existing Life is Strange game, and I was very curious going in how it was going to turn out. and. This feels right up there with the rest of the series, it doesn't feel noticeable that there has been a shift in the studio making this series, and I think that's a good thing. There's a couple of little moments in this series that feel like padding, it feels very clear that the main plot wasn't enough to sustain what they had planned and they needed to fill a bit of time, but the fact that I didn't care is a credit to this game. Um, when it is padding out the narrative, it does so in order to give you more time to explore the setting and the characters of this wonderful little enclosed community. Uh, it's done in creative ways both in terms of gameplay and presentation that are very different to everything else in the game, and feel like a very good use of your time. I could tell that it was padding, but I really didn't care, and if a game can get you to enjoy and not be bothered by the fact that you're having a little bit of padding away from the main story, I feel like that's a good sign that the characters and the writing are engaging enough that, you know, I wanted to be spending more time in that world, I didn't mind that I was going a little off the beaten path. While I have some quibbles about the execution of this game's visual and audio intensity warnings, I really wish they'd been handled a little differently, and I definitely also wish that this game had included some kind of content warnings available for people who needed them. I think that Life is Strange True Colours definitely hits the minimum bar of what I would expect out of this kind of genre of game in terms of accessibility. There are definitely things that could have been done better, and I've laid them out in this video, but there is a good baseline level of accessibility here, and I can live with that. Life is Strange True Colours isn't pushing any new ground in terms of accessibility or representation, but I find it hard to be too critical of any elements involved, which is a relief, because it makes recommending a game that I have had a wonderful fascinating time with all that much easier.